and gentlemen, gentlemen. Welcome to the Block Crunch Podcast, the go-to podcast for investors and builders in crypto. And before we get started, just a reminder for you guys out there, the Block Crunch Podcast is intended for informational purposes only. Neither the host nor its guests are licensed financial advisors, and nothing discussed should be construed as financial advice. Views held by BlockCrunch's guests are their own, and sponsorship messages do not constitute financial advice or endorsement. With that out of the way, let's jump right in. Now, before we get started with today's episode, I've got some great news for you. Now, a lot of you have been asking for how I analyze projects that I bring on the show. That's why I decided to create BlockCrunch VIP to share with you all the heavy research that goes on behind the scenes. Now, every week or so, our team prepares an in-depth research memo with things like sector analysis, technical concepts made simple, in-depth competitor breakdown, and even interactive models so you can learn about the most important projects before they become important. And our team is putting in hours every week scouring Discord, Twitter, forums, and blogs to help you get an edge in crypto and understand the latest projects and themes at the deepest levels that goes way beyond just an interview. Now, in addition, we'll also host exclusive AMAs with myself to answer any of your questions. So all of these are only available to BlockCrunch VIP subscribers. And the good news is that while our interviews will always be free, the VIP tier costs less than one coffee a day. So head on over to theblockcrunch.com slash VIP or click the link in the show notes below to sign up. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of the Block Crunch podcast. Now, things are looking a little bleak in DeFi if you've been following this space. Now, total deposits in DeFi have fallen from $180 billion at the peak to just $60 billion in a matter of months. And it seems like nothing could really reignite interest in DeFi ever again. And the same sentiment is shared by a lot of founders that I've been talking to recently because a handful of them are either giving up or basically stopping development because of concerns over unclear regulations, especially in light of the recent OFAC regulations. Now, that's why it's doubly exciting to see projects that continue to push forward. And one such project that I've been following is called Ribbon Finance. Now, as a disclaimer, I am a user of the product, but I am not an investor. Now, for those of you who are not familiar, Ribbon is a DeFi product that allows users easy access to crypto structure products. So they have an options vault, and it was the first of their kind, and it allows users to basically earn yield from option strategies simply by depositing their capital. And to date, this product alone has facilitated 7 to $10 billion in notional volume of options sold and earned about $4.2 million in protocol revenue. Now, more importantly, they have been experimenting with new ideas as well, such as issuing bonds for DAOs or allowing users to lend to institutions. So in this episode, we're also going to touch on all of these new plans, as well as the recently announced plans to launch a new exchange. And we're going to touch on the point about composability as well and whether it's still relevant in DeFi. Now, at the end, we also talk about how DeFi can remain relevant and whether all of these things that Ribbon are experimenting with can actually see mainstream adoption beyond a small group of crypto natives. So there's a lot of big questions that we're going to ask today. So I'm really happy to have Ribbon and its continual experimentation in DeFi and to explore all of this with the co-founder of Ribbon himself, Julian Ko. So let's kick it off. Thanks for having me on. I think this has been like a long time in the making. Yeah, it really has, man. We have uh, been talking about bringing you on the show for a little while. And I remember before you started Ribbon, we were chatting on Twitter DMs and you were, uh, we were talking about structured products already. Um, so can you tell me a little bit about how yeah, the yeah. idea of this came about and uh, you know, how did you go on this founder's journey? Yeah, so um, for some context, I, uh, prior to starting Ribbon, I was like a software engineer at Coinbase uh, for about one and a half years. And both my, my roommate and I, uh, who, who is now my co-founder, I think we were just spending a lot of our time, nights and weekends, just like playing around with DeFi. We were running all these liquidation bots and just trying to like make money uh, as like market participants in DeFi. And obviously, I think one very interesting data point was uh, when, when sort of DeFi summer rolled around, there was sort of like a whole influx of new protocols there were all these new yield opportunities. So, so we were already uh, sort of swamped by trying to make money off these things. And I think over that summer, uh, it became pretty clear that these yield opportunities were getting more and more absurd. Uh, so some of them, it started off as, you know, Compound launching their own liquidity mining program, but it quickly devolved into, you know, all, all these like meme coin, food farms, like... Uh, 
it, it sort of became a bit ridiculous at that point. And I think we, we, from our perspective, we were looking at it as like, okay, if like these yield opportunities devolved into these like Ponzi meme coins in one summer, like is yield farming really like a thing? Like will, will, will this exist in like five years? Uh, and I think we, we thought probably not. Um, and if we were sort of thinking about a world where, where yield farming didn't exist, where all these like shitcoin farming wasn't really a thing, how, what kinds of products would people use in DeFi? I think that was like the core genesis of like how we were thinking about things. And at the same time, we started seeing these like uh, Asian brokers uh, selling these like uh, d- dual income strategies and these types of like structured products initially to large Bitcoin miners and institutions. So we, we thought the, these products are actually quite interesting. I mean, if you're a user and you don't really understand options, uh, these types of products help you sort of simplify uh, what you're getting. So it, it, if Bitcoin goes up, maybe you, you get some yield in, in dollars. If Bitcoin goes down, maybe you automatically buy the dip. Some some sort of structure like that uh, was quite interesting. And I think we, we saw that, yeah, I mean, some of these brokers were just selling these things to large institutions or, or, or uh, miners. And, and we thought, what if we could bring that kind of product to DeFi uh, instead of sort of just um, creating some sort of uh, food farm? Like the, these types of products actually are like rooted in financial engineering. Like y- you can actually trade these products forever as long as crypto options exist. So I think we thought, okay, let, let's, this seems like a much more sustainable type of product that people will use. Uh, let's try and replicate this in DeFi. So we started the company about two years ago now. And um, I think uh, we, we, we spent the first like three months building it. And we launched like the first, uh, what is called like a DeFi option vault in, in uh, March or April of 2021. And yeah, growth has been really good since then. Yeah, and you guys worked on a lot more than just the option vaults. There uh, were a lot of different plans, and some of them were just announced. I guess by the time this comes out, it would have just been announced. And uh, by the time this comes out as well, there were pl- new plans that were announced one week before now as well. So we're going to cover all of that. But um, just for listeners who may not be as financially savvy, you know, what exactly is a structured product? Because it seems like there's a lot of varieties out there. You know, what does it have to do with options? And, you know, can you give maybe an example of how it works? Yeah, so I'll maybe walk through uh, the the most like typical use case of, of our, our most popular product, which is like the ETH covered call vault. So how that works is, or at least stepping back, uh, if you look at like the yield opportunities in DeFi for ETH, um, generally yields are pretty low on, on ETH or Bitcoin. The reason for that is because most of yields in DeFi come from uh, borrowing. So... I mean, any money market, uh, all, all of those rates come from people wanting to borrow these assets. But uh, every trading firm, every large borrower wants to borrow dollars. They, they, they don't want to borrow an asset which is volatile. So they end up borrowing stables. Rates on stables are generally much higher and no one really borrows ETH or Bitcoin. So because of that, I think historically, if, if you park your ETH in, in Aave or, or Compound for a year, you will get something in a range of like 10 to 30 basis points. So, so that's basically nothing. Um, it's extremely low. So if you are sort of willing to take a bit more risk and, and you want to earn like a high yield on ETH, well, what do you do? Uh, we, we think that is like our core target audience. And uh, I, I, a lot of those users, we think, come to Ribbon for that reason. And how our product works is, instead of just like lending your ETH where you earn like very passive low yield, um, what if you were interested in uh, selling some potential upside on the asset and getting paid for it today? So for example, um, I think uh, on the week of the merge, ETH was sort of sitting at about $1,600. Um, and if you, you thought, okay, I don't think ETH is going to go above like 2K this week, you can actually get paid for having that view. Uh, you can sell a call option that says like, okay, I, yeah, I, I really don't think ETH is going to go above 2K this week. Uh, 
uh, I'll get paid for taking on that view today. So uh, that, that was basically the call option that we sold uh, last week. And what our products do is you bring on ETH onto our platform. We help you do this trade over and over, over every single week. So every single week, you'll be selling an out of the money call option, which is basically a view that says like, I don't think ETH is going to go up by like 20, 30% this week. Um, so for taking on that view, uh, you get paid something in a range of 30 to 50 basis points a week. So I think, um, there's like a stark difference in like 10 basis points a year versus 30 to 50 a week. And our, our products are not something people just like set and forget forever it, because you, 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 it, it sort of requires a bit more market timing and, and, and thinking about, uh, risk, but I think people are generally interested in using these products for a few weeks at a time for maybe a few months at a time when they, they, they don't think ETH is going to do anything crazy. So yeah, I think that is like our bread and butter. We, we offer the exact same strategy on Bitcoin on a bunch of smaller cap assets. Uh, but our biggest products are still like the ETH covered call vaults. <clears throat> that this is you know slightly higher risk than you know, things like Aave and Compound where you just passively lending your capital out for that low yield. So can you outline what the risks are? Is there like a risk of capital loss if uh, if the contract expires, say like in the money? Yeah, exactly. So there is a risk of capital loss in, in terms of like the ETH that you put in. So for example, uh, you, you put in one ETH when ETH was at 1600 and you sold like the 2000 call option. If ETH suddenly doubles that week to like 3000, uh, you, you would have basically sold your ETH at 2K and, and you get back the remaining. So uh, you put in one ETH, currently ETH is worth 3K, but, but you only have 2K. So, so you, you do have capital loss um, in, in the case that ETH or, or some of these coins makes like a huge move uh, that week. But we think generally the product works pretty well because these capital loss scenarios only happen in like a major up move, which people are actually like generally happy about. So um, they are fine sort of earning, uh, selling this type of upside because uh, I mean, the rest of their bags would be going up as well like that week generally. So uh, yeah, that, that sort of, we think that's like the, the way people reason about why they use our product. Maybe capital loss was a bad way to describe. Maybe opportunity cost, like giving up the upside, is a better way to put it. Um, and it, I, I guess uh, unless yep. in the case of you know Ripon actually getting hacked, then you actually lose your capital. Um, but I would imagine you know that type of yep. strategy to be really popular in a time like this when prices seem to be just going one way, which is not up. Yeah. So I, I think some of the products like. Uh like the Solana covered call or like the AVEX covered call. I mean, th those tokens have been going down basically for almost a year now. So uh, if you are sort of like a Sol Maxi or like an AVEX Maxi, uh, we, we have those products for you. And every single week, you're just like stacking more Sol or stacking more AVEX. Um, so yeah, I think def definitely that's like a very popular type of behavior as well. Yeah, and I'd love to understand how these uh, products are structured as well. So obviously, uh, by abstracting away a lot of the complexities of actually executing a cover call strategy, uh, you guys are doing that trading basically on behalf of people who deposit. So how do you guys um, you know, handle those trades? Are there rules or transparent rules for how you guys select the strike price or how the options are settled? Or do users just kind of have to trust you guys to do it in a discretionary manner? Yeah, so we definitely don't want to be like a discretionary hedge fund or something where like you park your money here and we run your money. Uh, these are really automated uh, smart contracts. So they, they follow like a very specific rule set on how they select strikes, uh, how, how they sell the options and, and all, all of those rules are sort of codified on chain. So in, in our V1 version, we used to have like a concept of a manager where we select strikes and we, we do a lot of trading on behalf of the vault, but um, in our V2 version, which we launched maybe uh, start of the year, end of last year, uh, we really tried to automate as much as possible and, and try and put as much of like the, the, the brains of the product on chain uh, so that you, you wouldn't have to trust a human. Um, 
So yeah, how it works generally is we we target a specific type of option. So in in our case, uh, it's usually like a ten delta option, which is uh, which is like a pretty far out of the money option. And um, our our contracts would basically select this option, select this strike, and mint a bunch of these uh, options contracts. And on the flip side of that, uh, as you know, like I mean, if we have twenty thousand ETH in the vault, we 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 need to sort of offload twenty thousand ETH calls into the market. So on, on the flip side, we need to figure out how can we get the best execution for selling off all these ETH calls in size. Um, so we have gone through like many iterations of this process, and we have spent like a ton of time trying to improve execution of the product. Yeah, actually, that is another question that I had because now that you remove this uh, more or less transparent uh, discretionary process and made it into a totally on-chain and transparent process, you're basically almost acting like a automated hedge fund that publicizes the strategies, kind of similar to depositors and AMMs are basically you know publicizing the strategies. And whenever you publicize your strategies, we know some sophisticated market maker out there is going to take advantage of that. So has that happened for Ribbon? Like, do you see market makers basically trying to time these option settlements? Yes, because they, they know ahead of time exactly what time you guys will be selling a lot of options, for instance. Like, has that affected returns or how, how does that affect the protocol? Yeah, so um, this is like very hot topic about, uh, you know, all these different DOVs, which are like basically our competitors. All of us are doing like the exact same trades. It's like a really, really crowded trade. And... Uh, a smart market maker or a smart trading firm should be able to front run our flow, uh, like the flow from all these different products, which just sell a bunch of calls or puts. Um, so we, we have actually seen front running behavior in the market. I think initially when Ribbon was much smaller, it, it didn't really matter. Uh, like our size was too small for any serious person to care. But um, in sort of, Q1 or Q2 of this year where like our vaults were selling something in a range of $300 million notional every single week that those sizes really mattered. And that's when uh, we, we actually saw like some of the vaults, people would front run the vaults and then um, basically sell it before we do and rebuy it later. Um, but I think we, the, the solution to that is like, it, it's like a pretty complicated game theory problem. And I think we figured out the best solution to this is really, just to make these processes as um, competitive as possible. So initially, if there are only like two market makers who participate in our auctions, like anyone else in the whole world could front run this flow. But I think if we, we, I think we have brought on like a ton of people participating in our auctions. So something in the range of like 10 to 20. Um, if all the big trading firms are basically aware that, that this kind of front running stuff happens, they, they would like price that in and how they participate in our vaults. Um, all of them would basically compete on each other to buy back the flow. So I think we have just learned that like making these things as competitive as possible between all the major trading firms has significantly improved pricing, has significantly reduced like the gaming of, of these products. And I mean, if anyone is still trying this, these types of strategies, they're basically competing against like the, the top 20 trading firms in the world, um, which is like quite difficult. So yeah, I, I would say um, initially it happened quite a lot. And now we, we have just tried a bunch of strategies to mitigate it, including making it as competitive as possible. That's really interesting. So it's almost like the problem solves itself. When, when the product gets large enough, you attract more market makers and they kind of compete away that, that potential arbitrage there. Um, because I, I do remember seeing some other yep. people kind of propose a solution. Maybe you randomize the time every week uh, where you set all the options. So instead of telling the whole world that, hey, at like 4 p.m. today, we're going to settle all the options, you kind of just like pick a different time every day. Um, so it seems like there was a lot of out there ideas that people have explored before. And it's really interesting to see it all kind of converges of solving the problem itself just by, you know, the, mark, the, the product growing. Um, so, and I'm also curious, so in terms of the types of people that you guys are targeting with these vaults, it's definitely not the sophisticated market makers because they probably execute their own covered call strategy. They prefer to select their own strike and so on. So is this mostly retails or is it like maybe DAOs and treasuries that you guys are targeting? So our products are generally skewed much more retail. Um, I think the last time I ran the numbers, which was uh, 
sort of admittedly a few months ago, uh, the median depositor in our products was something in the range of 10 to 50 K US. So definitely on the smaller side, uh, and, and, and it, it sort of goes up. I think we have one user who at, at, at the peak had 10 to 15 million US in, in one of our mm-hmm. products. Um, but yeah, I think as far as we know, we don't have any like large institutional guys who use our products a lot, uh, or maybe they do without telling us. So I think generally just because of our marketing or our community, our, our products skew a bit more retail. Um, and I, I think we are aware that like some of our competitors skew a bit more whale heavy or institutional heavy. I think uh, what, what, since, since we have sort of started out retail focused, uh, one angle that we are trying to do now to grow our products is, yeah, find the hundred biggest crypto whales in the world who want to use this type of product, like hunt them down one by one and, and try to get them to use it. So we, we, are tr- we started out retail and we're trying to move up uh, to the institutional side now. Yeah, I love that go-to-market strategy. And it's really interesting because so even before Ribbon, there were some other uh, kind of automated strategies. There weren't exactly like options faults, but uh, these were things like index funds or, um, you know, thematic funds that automatically rebalance, maybe like Metaverse index and so on. Um, And we've never really seen any of these take off to the extent that Ribbon has. So what would you say are the biggest reasons that people or these like retail sort of depositing 10 to 50K I seem to be much more interested in Ribbon Vaults than any of these other um, packaged products that came before. Yeah, I think, um, as you mentioned, like some of these index funds or thematic funds, these things have like, a, they, they sort of come in waves. Like sometimes this idea is interesting and then people want to go trade this thing for a while, but they, they sort of die off. I mean, if you look at like the DPI stuff, um, there was a lot of interest in DPI when DeFi was hot and then sort of DeFi coins just went down a lot and people just lost interest in using that product. I think for us, uh, we target specifically uh, yield products on majors, which is something that every crypto person uh, owns. Some part of their, their portfolio is in ETH or Bitcoin or USDC. Um, and I think our focus is really just like... Um, we we think like the there there really isn't much alternatives in DeFi if you want like high yields on ETH or Bitcoin. So um, because of that, you, you you almost have to use Ribbon if you are looking for the type of uh, yield profile. Um, so yeah, I think it's very different from like trying to sell people a thematic idea compared to like this is the 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 the, the place that you can get high yield on on your ETH or Bitcoin for some part of your portfolio. I think that's like an easier sell and something that doesn't like go away once like the hype cycle disappears. Yeah, I really like the way that you thought about the pain point. Like you guys are actually trying to solve the problem that um, people who hold ETH and don't want to sell their ETH, they want to earn yield on that ETH ideally. Um, versus you know trying to convince yep. people that, hey, the metaverse is going to be the next big thing or DeFi is going to be hard to invest in this index fund and so on. Um, but I do want to transition away from just talking about the options vaults because it seems like the vision for Ribbon is larger than these vaults. Um, so you guys uh, pushed for products called uh, Ribbon Earn and Ribbon Lend. Um, and then by the time this comes out, you will also have announced your exchange plans. And then before that, there was also an a initiative to sell bonds to uh, for, for DAOs to issue bonds. So I'd love to touch on all of those. Uh, let's start with... Um, ribbon earn and ribbon lend first. So what exactly are these ideas and how do they tie into the original kind of ribbon vision? Yeah, so I think if we, it started off by us taking a, a step back and seeing, okay, there, there were all these new entrants into like the DeFi option vault space. All of us were sort of doing some flavor of the same thing realistically. Um, and it, it was really difficult for any of these players to have like a strong moat because all of, all of us uh, ran similar strategies. There's no like alpha there. It's just a systematic strategy. Uh, all of us traded against the same big trading firm. So there's no like long-term pricing advantage there. Uh, the only main differentiators were maybe small tweaks in strategy or, or fee structure or branding, uh, which is really, I think that that wasn't like an area that we wanted to play in necessarily. Um, so we started looking at a bunch of different, uh, ideas. And I think one, one exercise that we did was like, 
go let's go speak to some of these structured product brokers in Asia. Like who are the biggest ones? Like Amber, uh, Babel used to be really big. And, and we just try to understand like what is their business model? What kinds of products do they sell? Um, and I think the what stood out for us uh, very clearly is like most of these guys run two types of businesses. Uh, one of them is like a borrow lend desk where uh, they, they basically run like a very big borrow and lending business. And the second part is they run like this top, this sort of structured product business uh, where these two businesses are very synergistic because they could use structured products as like an interesting payoff for, for, for users to come and bring on their assets onto the platform. Uh, but they, they also have like a, a huge borrow land business to sort of create these yields for some of the products, the structured products that they are selling. So I, I, I really do think these two things like go hand in hand. So we, we, we looked at that very closely and, and we thought maybe we should just like rep, like sort of decompose what Babel is and, and do it on chain or, or something. Uh, what does that actually look like? So um, for first we started out, uh, we, we, we launched this product category, uh, this product called Ribbon Earn, which is basically uh, our current products are these DOVs you are taking some market risk by, by selling a put or a call. Uh, these are, are, are not risk-free strategies, right? Like you can lose your principle of the market, like goes up or down a lot. And I think a, a second big type of structured product category that we thought was very interesting is what people call, you know, like principle protected products or, or like capital protected products, where basically even if like the market goes up or goes down by, I don't know, two X or three X, like you're, you, you're not sort of exposed to, to market risk, uh, but you're, you're slightly more like maybe Delta neutral or, 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 or your, your worst case outcome is you get your money back. So we think those types of products are very compelling to retail. And, um, that's sort of what ribbon, uh, earn is where basically it, it has two components. First, we generate yield through lending. And we take some of that interest and we, we help you like buy options. The reason why that is interesting is because we, we all know crypto is really, really volatile on like a week to week basis. So if you are just sort of earning interest, you get like a, a flat payoff. Like at the end of the year, you park your money in like a, you lend your money to someone, you get like a fixed rate over a year. Nothing interesting there. Um, but if you maybe take some of those interest uh, payments and you actually buy some options, you, you have like a chance of multiplying your, your final payoff uh, by a lot if, if the market is volatile on a week to week basis. So we, we thought that structure would be very interesting um, in DeFi and, and we launched that uh, as a product called Ribbon Earn. So we, uh, we launched that a few weeks ago. I think we had like a $5 million cap and, um, it is really like a brand new product. We we still don't know if people want it, but so far I think there has been quite a lot of interest. Like the, the there were like five mil of deposits in the first like day or two. Uh, so even in a bear market, we think this kind of thing is interesting. Uh, so so that's sort of how Ribbon Earn works. And on the flip side of that, I think uh, as I mentioned before, how Ribbon Earn works is it has a lending component, and this lending component is basically an uncollateralized loan to one of the big trading firms. Um, so some options that we were considering is like, okay, what if we like compose ribbon earn with like Maple Finance or we compose ribbon earn with one of these other uncollateralized lending platforms where, you know, we use Maple for, for the lending component and then we use like our own ribbon stuff for the option component. We thought that could be quite interesting, but eventually we we sort of came to the conclusion of like, yeah, what if, why don't we just own our own lending platform as well? Like, what if we own the whole stack where we, we, we don't like send our flow to someone else, but we, we really just own like the entire product stack. Um, so that's like the core idea of Ribbon Lend. We think it's, um, we are just productizing something that we may have chosen to like compose to someone else instead. Um, so yeah, I know that's like a, a very, uh, long mouthful but um i'll sort of leave it there for, for you to ask questions 
Hey guys, I'm really excited to tell you more about one of my favorite products in crypto right now, DYDX. This is a team I've known since 2018, and they've built one of the best exchange venues out there that also happens to be decentralized and mobile friendly. Now listen until the end because there's an opportunity for savvy traders out there as well. And here are just a few reasons why I like DYDX over other exchanges. First, it's very liquid. It processes two to $3 billion every day in volume and has 35 perpetual swaps as of this recording, which means you can trade things like Ethereum, Bitcoin, Doge, Solana, and most of the most popular assets with up to 20X leverage in the venue today. Now, second, it's also extremely cheap. And if you're down bad from the bear market, you don't have to worry about gas fees at all because there is no gas fee on Starkware Layer 2 where DYDX is built on. Now that brings me to my next point as well. It's incredibly fast. Unlike other layer two and high-speed DEXs, you don't actually have to wait to withdraw your assets anymore. And as an additional point, by using Starkware, DYDX also provides user with increased security and privacy. And my personal favorite feature is the cross-margin feature, which means I can seed one account with USDC and trade across multiple markets from there without needing to start sub-accounts because I really hate managing so many different sub-accounts. And their iOS mobile app is also live right now, and it's amazing because it's compatible with MetaMask, Coinbase Wallet, Coin98, Huobi Wallet, and a lot of the most popular mobile wallets out there. And it's available for people outside of the US or sanctioned countries today. And one last thing, one exciting opportunity is their competitions. The most recent tier in the $10,000 equity tier have won over $95,000 in rewards. And you can get started with as low as $500 in equity to compete for prizes. So if you're already trading, might as well get paid to do it. So if any of that sounds interesting to you, I highly recommend that you head on over to dydx.exchange to learn more. And I thank them for sponsoring this episode. Yeah, I'd love to dive into, you know, the, the kind of uh, risk management side, considering that there's a lot of, uh, you know, huge landing desks that kind of blew up and also um, the situation with like three arrows and uh, actually one week before this episode would have come out, Wintermute was also hacked, a large market maker. Um, but before I touch on that, I want to make sure we, we you know, double click on this point. You mentioned wanting to verticalize and capture all layers of the stack instead of composing with protocols that already exist. And that's the similar philosophy that you've carried in the other arm of the business, which we'll talk about later, which is the exchange arm. So that seems to be yep. a general trend that I see in projects that get successful. They want to verticalize. We saw this with DIDX as well, verticalizing into their own kind of layer one. Um, but that seems to be very much against the idea of composability, of plugging into different protocols in crypto. So how do you reconcile the two? Is, is composability just a meme? Like at the end of the day, everyone just wants to capture as much value as possible in their own protocol. <laughs> I mean, I, I don't think composability is like a meme uh, for like a small... I mean, if, if you think about any large like tech company, I don't know, Google or, or Amazon, you know, they, they start off by uh, rent. Oh, yeah, I don't know. Any, any tech company maybe starts off by renting their own, like renting servers from AWS. And then once they get big enough, like Google, maybe they realize, well, why don't we just like own that part of the stack as well? So I think it's just like a natural shift of when projects get small, they, they literally don't have the resources to build multiple parts of the stack. They just need to own like a very specific niche. Uh, but once they get bigger and bigger, it becomes more and more interesting to just uh, own deeper parts of the stack. So, yeah, I, I don't think this is particularly a crypto specific thing. Um, and yeah, I, I think we generally, uh, Ribbon generally has like a preference for like, why why can't we do this ourselves kind of mentality. Uh, we, we don't think, I, I, I think if, if we are trying to compete against someone like you know, like Lido or, or, or Uniswap, we, we think like those projects have really have like an extremely big head start and, and they have like a huge market share. So it really doesn't make sense to compete with those guys. But maybe for smaller projects where we, we have maybe like an equal shot or, or, or slightly less than equal shot at winning the market, we think it's worth doing. So yeah, that's how I think about um, in which cases do we compose, in which cases do we just try and own the whole stack. So uh, for example, maybe um, we we work with this company called uh, Paradigm Trade Paradigm. They are like this uh, RFQ system that helps that that basically uh, helps us improve our execution. And maybe you could ask the question of like, why don't we just build our own version of Paradigm, uh, which is possible in in some case. But I think we have seen like 
Paradigm has built their business over five years or something. They have plugged in like a thousand professional trading firms. At this point, it really doesn't make sense at all to compete with them. Like they are, they are too huge and too entrenched, we think, to, to compete. So in those cases, we are like more than happy to just partner with them and, and quote unquote compose with them. Um, so yeah, that's how I think about composition versus sort of doing it yourself. That, that makes a lot of sense. I love the nuance that composability is almost like a bootstrapping mechanism versus, you know, the, the, the end state of things for DeFi. And I didn't really think about that. Um, and I guess going back to this idea of creating a product on Ribbon that allows retails to lend money to centralized, you know, market making desk or, you know, a huge credit desk and so on. Um, how do you underwrite the risk for these things? Because, um, you know, historically, they've been having a pretty spotty history with the, with the whole kind of three arrows thing that happened recently. Um, so how do, how, do, how do you ensure that users, you know, are not going to just lose their funds um, if, if one of these firms blow up? Yeah, so we, th- we actually do think Ribbon Lend is a bit more of a sophisticated product. So how it works is... Um, Let's like take a step back and, and look at uh, another person who's who's in this space, which is Maple Finance. How how their product works is they have these idea they have this idea of a, a pool delegate. So for example, if I'm like an expert at underwriting credit risk, I can create a pool on Maple Finance, and retail users can basically deposit with me, and I basically decide. Okay, I have a hundred mil of deposits. I'm going to lend it out to XYZ firm because I know XYZ firm is like uh it is like a good yeah in good financial standing uh and so on. So Maple really relies on these delegates to uh to to decide who who these loans go out to and so on. Uh which is like a fantastic model. Uh but I think we we have seen that uh for some more sophisticated uh DeFi users, for example, maybe like yourself or myself, like we we know these firms, like we know who Alameda is, we know who Wintermute is. Uh, instead of you letting the delegate choose who the money goes to, like what if you just want to lend money to Alameda directly? Um, I mean, if you go, if you hit up their OTC desk and, and you work with them and figure out how to lend to them, uh, you probably need like a $10 million minimum. So, so we think that's like way too high for your, your regular crypto whale. Um, but if Alameda could spin up their own pool and, and you as a market participant, you decide yourself that, okay, I, I, I think Alameda is good. I want to lend to them directly. You can do that. So um, this obviously puts a lot more of like the quote unquote credit underwriting responsibility to the user itself. I think we see it somewhat like P2P loans to institutional trading firms. Um, but obviously, I think we are going to try our best to surface as much information as possible about these trading firms. Um, for example, there's this company called Credora who does like these credit underwriting scores for uh, trading firms. So we are working with Credora to surface like a credit score on our platform. Um, and we, we are going to be trying more and more things to make it as, to, to try and let like, retail users like uh, ourselves have as much information as possible before we make the decision of who we want to lend to. Um, so yeah, that's how we think about the difference between us and, and, and Maple. Uh, I actually personally uh, think like, oh yeah, I, I trust my own judgment. I, I, I know Winter is like a really reputable firm. I want to lend to them. So I, I don't think this product really exists in crypto yet. Um, and I think the whole platform is really like centered around who these borrowers are. This is like the Wintermute pool. If you trust Wintermute, uh, maybe you want to lend to them directly. Uh, there, there's none of this like middleman who's helping you make your decision. So yeah, that, that's how the platform works. And we think there's like quite a big market for it. Yeah, that's quite interesting. And uh, we actually just had Maple on the on the podcast as well. And we wrote a, about a 15-page report on what Maple is and how it works and the token and so on for our VIP. So listeners, if you want to check that out, definitely go. feel free to do that. Um, I'd love to talk a little bit about the exchange plans as well. Because um, so I know to date, Ribbon has been integrated with Open, uh, O-P-Y-N, which is the uh, you know, DeFi options exchange where you settle a lot of your options. 
But uh, by the time this comes out, I think you would have announced your exchange plans and you guys basically decided to move away from open and build your own exchange, which is a huge endeavor in and of itself. So why, why uh, you know, what prompted this decision and, you know, how, um, you know, how, how important is it for, uh, for the ribbon vision? Yeah. So, um, yeah, stepping back from like the whole structured product side of stuff, I think we saw that, um, I, I think in the introduction, you, you, you said like we have done $7 billion of option volume It's actually closer to 10 and we've traded like 40 mil, uh, 40 something million dollars of like premium. So we have actually processed like pretty big size on, on like, uh, in terms of how many options we trade on our platform. Um, and I think one, uh, but going back to the idea of like composability or, or uh, vertical integration, one idea that we thought was very interesting was what if, what if like an, an exchange and like a DOV were like the same thing? Uh, what if like, in, if you're like a sort of less sophisticated user, you, you, you come to the platform, uh, you just put your money in these vaults and, and, and they help you run a strategy. But if you're a pro trader, um, really in crypto right now in the DeFi landscape, like that doesn't, that, yeah, that doesn't exist like a good options trading platform. If you want to buy anything in the size of a hundred to a thousand ETH notional, uh, you wouldn't find that liquidity anywhere on any chain. We think that's just like ridiculous because a thousand ETH notional is not a lot for, for any like uh serious trader. So we, we started out with the, the, the mindset of like, can we build like the best options trading experience in crypto in DeFi period? And can we use our existing DOV flow to actually make our business like successful? Uh, we think the answer to that is yes. And um, we have seen basically a lot of people have tried to build options exchanges in DeFi. Uh, there've been basically many, many, many attempts, many dead bodies, I would say. <laughs> um, and the main reason for this, we think, is because um, it's really difficult to bootstrap an exchange. To bootstrap an exchange, you need to, it's like bootstrapping any marketplace. You need to get the market makers on the platform, and then you need to get like the retail trader, the retail flow on the other side. But if the retail flow doesn't exist, no market maker wants to integrate and, and vice versa. So there's like this cold start problem of like, where's the flow going to come from? And I think if you talk to any of like the largest options trading firms in the world and you, you, you say, Hey guys, I have like a new options exchange idea. Like, can you guys market make for us? The, if it's like a very involved, like API driven business where they have to like quote many, many markets, uh, 24 seven, that's going to take them a few months for them to build that integration. And if you don't have any track record of any, of bringing in any flow, if you have zero users, they're just going to tell you like, okay, where, where are your users? Why are we going to spend three months of integration uh, if you don't even have a single trader on your platform? Um, we, we think that's like generally why it's difficult to bootstrap a new exchange. Um, but if we already have these DOV businesses that are every single week, they're selling a hundred mil of options. Uh, if you connect these two products, like the DOV is basically a source of flow, a, a, a constant source of flow. And um, we think like that's one very easy way for us to bootstrap the market. So if we tell the market makers, hey guys, we're actually gonna like integrate our vaults into our exchange. If you wanna continue participating in our vaults, which you, you do, cause you have built all these processes and like you've built your business around our vaults, uh, you, you, you actually have to integrate our exchange. So, so we think that's like a very strong, compelling uh, reason for them to do it. and. Um, I think combining like the DOVs with an exchange is also like really, really good for the market makers. So for example, right now, if you're a market maker, you buy these, like I buy a thousand call options from Ribbon, uh, I buy like 10,000 call options from Ribbon. Right now, these things get represented as like useless O tokens in your wallet. Like there's no secondary market for it. Uh, it's really just like a bilateral trade that you can't exit out of. But what if like, when you go and buy the options from the DOV, this, these actually like appear in your account as like a real position that you can like trade over the course of the week. If, if the, if the positions like going in your favor, you actually get margin to do more things. 
that, that really incentivizes you to use like the platform more. If I'm really bidding these uh, options every week from the vaults, maybe I want to trade other things against it. I want to hedge it on the same venue. Uh, we think th th these are like sort of the characteristics we need to just bootstrap uh, the exchange and bootstrap trading. Um, so yeah, that, that was like the vision here. And I think we, we are launching this uh, in Q4 of this year. Um, and I think, yeah, our goal is just like, let's build the best options trading experience in DeFi. Uh, we're going to have deep liquidity on day one. We're going to have over a hundred uh, instruments uh, across multiple like strikes and expiries. We're only going to start off with ETH options for now. Um, and yeah, I think like onboarding should be extremely trivial. Anyone with a MetaMask wallet can just bring on USDC and start trading immediately. So we think those are like the three key factors of, of uh, differentiation. Uh, and that's at least how we think we can win the options trading side as well. Yeah, that, that's fascinating. And I'm sure a question that a lot of the listeners probably asking is, you know, how does this tie into the, uh, you know, existing ribbon token? Is this a separate token or separate business? Or, you know, how do you make sure that, um, you know, this doesn't fragment or, you know, confuse the value of, you know, what RBN does? Yeah, so uh, the, the exchange is going to have its own separate brand, but it will still definitely be like within the ribbon ecosystem. Uh, it's still like TBD on, on, on token plans. So I, I don't want to like jump the gun there. Um, but yeah, I mean, we are not launching this as like a, a non like side project, you know, like this is part <laughs> of the ribbon product uh, suite. And we think, for example, there can be a lot of very nice synergies. For example, like, uh, yeah, what if, um, if, if we own the DOV and the exchange, w w we can just like set our DOV fees to zero forever. And, and just like starve all our other competitors because that is like their, their core business. That's the only thing that generates revenue for them. But now we have like so many other sources of revenue from the lending business, from the exchange. We can just set like these things to be loss leaders. So yeah, I think um, we we think like the, the ribbon suite of products actually like work well together in like a business setting. Um, so yeah, we, we are not trying to like spin these out as like, you know, uh, new shit side projects like I like just just like launch every business is own that side project yeah yeah that makes sense and I, speaking of kind of different initiatives that the final one I wanted to touch on is one that I thought was really really interesting so it was a shame that their project actually shut down so to give some context this is your integration with Porter Finance where you allowed DAOs to issue their bonds so so far DAOs have pretty much been raising pseudo equity by, you know, issuing tokens for people to buy their tokens, but you guys allow them a new way of financing, which is uh, issuing dot bonds. And I believe you did this through a project called Porter, Porter Finance. But then recently <laughs> the project shut down uh, because of I think regulatory concerns, which we'll touch on later. But uh, tell us a little bit about what was the genesis for that idea and kind of any interesting lessons and takeaways from that. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, we have seen, like a, a lot of DAOs, they own a lot of their own token and, and some people consider it like treasury, but r really like the market is too illiquid for them to sell it or something. Uh, so realistically, like it's very difficult for them to convert their treasury into cash. So people are looking for alternative ways of DAOs to raise money effectively, uh, cash. And, and we think bonds are actually like quite an interesting um Quite an interesting space. I mean, if you like, if you see uh, Protocol X has been generating revenue uh, every single week, Protocol revenue, why wouldn't you extend some credit to them via like some sort of bond? Um, it, if you think the business won't materially change in the next six months, if you don't think revenue will disappear, like it, it really does make sense that uh, the the DAO probably paid back. So. From the DAO perspective, this sort of opens up a new way for them to raise money. From a user perspective, this opens up like a new type of yield opportunity for, for users. And generally these um, bonds will probably have like a much higher yield than uh, a money market, for example. So yeah, we, we thought that was like an interesting uh, problem space in crypto. And I think for us, we, we also had the same issue. like. Uh, we wanted to bootstrap like a, 
like like maybe a very simple use case is maybe the DAO wants to increase some protocol on liquidity for their own token. Uh, how how if it wants if it owns a lot of token of their own native token, they need a parrot in the AMM with like stables or, or ETH. Where does it get that ETH? Um, so yeah, I, I think selling a bond is a very interesting way of, of getting of, of obtaining that ETH or, or dollars. Um, and it, it actually sort of allows the DAO to, to LP their own token, for example. So yeah, we, we think that's like a pretty interesting use case. So we, we did raise a few million dollars uh, as like a first customer of, of the Porter platform. Uh, we, we had a bunch of uh, initiatives, which are sort of now a bit dead because of like some Rari hack situation. Uh, but we, we had some ideas of using the Fuse protocol for, for some stuff. Um, so we, we did raise some money uh, via the bond for that. But yeah, I think it's a bit of a shame that um, they they sort of decided not to, to proceed. I think we were considering maybe just like absorbing that part of the business and like doing it ourselves. But um, we, 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 we just thought that there'll be higher leverage opportunities like doing the lending platform. So yeah, I think once they, they shut down, we sort of thought, okay, maybe, maybe it was an interesting experiment, but uh, we, we don't really want to like continue pushing out this, this business uh, line. Uh, so yeah, we, we, we actually facilitated some early redemption sort of bond and, and so on. Um, so yeah, it, it was like a very cool DeFi experiment, but I, it hadn't really like yielded anything uh, materially useful uh, in practice. Mm. Yeah, and I love how, as a founder, how how cognizant you are of like the size of the market, like each of the markets you tap into as well. It was clear that the DAO idea is interesting, but the DAO market is still really immature. The opportunity is much smaller than what you're doing with Ribbon Earn, Lend, and also the exchange plans. Um, so I love yeah. to kind of tie it all up together. So it sounds like all of these initiatives within the Ribbon ecosystem, you know, the vaults, Earn, Lend. Um, to a certain uh, to, to to a certain extent, uh, exchange as an extension of DOB. These all have to do with sustainable yield in DeFi, which is you know a refreshing idea, given that a lot of the yield is just you know unsustainable inflationary rewards. Um, do you think that is what is going to be the main driver of growth for DeFi in the coming you know two three years? Like just people finding ways to abstract sustainable yield to retails. Yeah, I, I I definitely think so. Um, obviously, like the um, the dark side to this is basically platforms like Celsius and and others who 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 market some sort of yield thing, uh, and under the hood they they do all sorts of. I mean, no one really knows what they do, right? Um, so yeah, I I think definitely this is uh, an area of growth that we see. Uh, but we we are also very aware that like. The, these things can be exploited very heavily. Like, I mean, uh, if, if a project says that they, they deliver like sustainable yield, like you, you actually need to understand what their business does. Um, no, not all sustainable yield is equal, I, I would say. Uh, I think for us, like at, at least for our option vaults and a bunch of other stuff, uh, we, we know for sure, like as long as crypto options exist, we can create these products. Like, you are selling risk. You, you're getting paid to sell risk. You're not getting free money from like the, the air. So, so we think the products that we are all building are all like really, uh, it, it really sort of facilitates like a yield product through selling some sort of risk. So these are, are real things that um, will exist in any market environment. Like even in the depths of a bear market, people want to sell options. Uh, so yeah, I, I think we are, uh, our, our focus is just on, on, on this, this kind of idea where like we, we, we don't only want to create stuff that works in bull markets and doesn't work in other market environments. <laughs> uh, if, if, if option markets persist, if like financial engineering is real, if people want to transfer risk to each other, which we think people do, uh, our products will still exist. So yeah, I think that's like the core thesis of the business and um, that's how we think we will sort of persist in for, for the next five to 10 years. And speaking of kind of sustainable yield, which I agree is probably what is going to keep DeFi relevant because, you know, clearly 
anchor type deals are not sustainable. Um, there are two big ideas that I think we haven't talked about, which is, you know, stake and yield. We're going to have an actual yield on Ethereum now that we're proof of stake and also tranche products where you can create a relatively high yield on, you know, a fixed yield product by just tranching the yield into two. Um, have you guys thought about doing things in either of those arenas? You know, why didn't you guys prioritize those over what you guys ended up doing? Yeah, I think um, I've recently been very fascinated with like, uh, this is like funny to say, but like the original idea of Anchor, which was like, what, what, like the, the original idea of Anchor was really interesting. It was, what if you could create a money market where like the core driver of these yields in the money market uh, come from proof of stake yields, so like native crypto yield uh, that that's sort of paid by the blockchains itself. Uh, I think that's a very very interesting idea. Um, we we don't we don't think we have any edge in that market, so it's like really difficult for us to to do anything competitive there. But uh, yeah, I mean, I think in terms of like what is sustainable, that is obviously like one of like the core axioms of, of crypto is just like uh, block rewards. Uh, so, I mean, there, there are some other projects that are doing some sort of um, derivatives around like block rewards and stuff. So, I mean, you know, all, all, all like the proof of stake MEV related stuff or, or like block space, like futures and, and all, all these, the, these are still like a very nascent area. So I think, we're not sure how we can compete in that yet, uh, but we'll just, I, I just find it very, very interesting intellectually. Um, and I forgot what your, your second point was. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I'm just generally curious if you've looked into like, uh, so state, state deal was one of them and tranche products. At one point there were a lot of these projects like Barnbridge, oh, yes. I think Saffron working on these ideas. And I think we talked a little bit about that as well um, when we first chatted. So curious if you thought about that for Ribbon and what do you think of that as another driver of maybe sustainable yield for DeFi? Yeah, I think uh, it definitely fits into like the core thesis of, you know, tranches are, are really nothing more than just like risk transfer. So there are naturally people in the world who want to take more risk than others uh, on, on the same type of opportunity. So that naturally leads itself to some sort of splitting of risk between two types of people. So I, I definitely do think that that idea has some legs, but um, we just really haven't seen that working at any scale in DeFi yet. Um, I think we are not sure if we want to be like first movers and trying to do that ourselves. But uh, yeah, I mean, I'm like very plugged into the space. So I, I just like, I, I, I just try and keep my, my ears as close as the ground uh, as possible. So if any of these things like get any meaningful traction, I think uh, I, I'm paying a lot of attention. But for now, it seems like there's just naturally not that much interest. But some of these things may just be a timing thing. Like these things could suddenly kick off. Uh, maybe. I don't know. Uh, mm. So yeah, th those are, I, I think you do raise good points. Those are very two very interesting uh categories that we could look at. Uh, we just haven't really considered it yet. Got it. And I think, Julian, my final question for you is probably the biggest one here because, you know, in recent conversations, especially with newer founders in this space, right, people who came in in the past six, 12 months, uh, a lot of them are really scared about regulation after the tornado cash thing, and they don't know what they can build and what, what you know, regulations they have to pay attention to. A lot of the OGs, people who have been in this space for a long time, they're kind of just still trudging forward. Um, so it's really, you know, reassuring to see founders like yourself still pushing for all these new products, but how do you think about, you know, regulations? Are you worried that, you know, you get shut down one day or how, what is the solution to something like that? Yeah, I think, um, I, I also do like some angel investments. So like some of the other founders, I, I talk to about this kind of stuff quite a lot. And I think there are some like one way doors that if you do it, like you can't ever take it back. For example, if you do a token sale, you can't unwind that in two years. Like you did it in the past. Like it's, you, you can't take that back from the market. Um, so that kind of thing it, we think is quite scary because uh, if some sort of regulators uh, consider whatever token you launch as a security, you effectively did like an unregistered security sale and, and you can't walk it back. 
but so so that's the kind of thing that we generally try to avoid as a company just trying to figure out which are the one-way doors that we can never come back from uh whereas you know other, other things like um well what is your like kyc aml policy like what kind of terms and conditions do you show on your website like how do you enforce geo blocking? How do you enforce uh, the, these types of restrictions on your front end? We we think these are things that you know, if a regulator tells you that this is bad, you you can change. Like these are things you can fix. Uh, you can say, okay, sorry, we 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 did a few. We 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 sort of didn't enforce this back then, but we are enforcing it now. Uh, we have seen every major crypto exchange go from like a non KYC exchange to a KYC exchange, right? So. Like if they can do it, I I think DeFi protocols can do it too. So yeah, I I would say um I I just pay much more attention to like the 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 things that we cannot take back and then don't really sweat the the rest. Um mm. and I think I I forgot who who told me this in the past, but he was like I I think it was Kane or something. Where I think when we were just studying our seed round, Kane told me something like uh they're going to go for synthetics before they go for me. Right. So I think as like, <laughs> as like, as like very small startups, um, uh, like you shouldn't be that worried, uh, because I mean, you have no users anyway. So, uh, maybe, maybe these are things that you can think about a bit later on. Um, especially if you, you launch your product and you get meaningful scale, then you, you start thinking about these things. But yeah, I mean, Generally, all, all crypto companies operate like that. Uh, e- even like FTX, right? Which is almost like the the poster boy of like crypto regulation these days in the US. Um, they also started out as like a you know non KYC exchange or something, or like a low KYC exchange. So yeah, that that's sort of how how I think about the regulations. Yeah. Stuff. It's definitely a very nuanced and delicate topic as well. Um, I think a lot of the, uh, you know, a lot of the newer founders are just scared off by unclear regulation. But I do think it will clear up in the long term. So I, I do think, uh, you know, things look brighter in the days ahead. Well, Julian, I, I've taken a lot of your time already. Um, I want to give some back to you. So uh, for people who want to continue learn, learning more about Ribbon and follow you and, you know, you try out different Ribbon products, what are some of the best channels for them to do this? Yeah, I think uh, just go to ribbon.finance. You'll see links to ev- everything we do there or uh, follow us on Twitter, uh, twitter.com slash ribbonfinance. Uh, we, we post all product announcements and, and everything there. So uh, yeah, I would say those are like the two best places to uh, um, follow what the project's up to. Yeah, definitely. And thank you so much once again for coming on the show. This has been really fun. Thank you. See ya. Yeah. All right, that's it for this week's episode of the Blockrange Podcast. So thank you so much for tuning in. If you enjoyed this episode, please make sure to subscribe on your favorite apps. And in case you didn't know, this interview is also available as a video on YouTube. And if you tag the Blockrange on Twitter this week and tell us what you liked about this episode, I'll be sure to respond to you as well. Now, if you'd like to go even deeper, we have a VIP tier where every week or so, we write an in-depth research brief or investment memo on a project. And we'll have exclusive AMAs with myself where I answer all your questions as well. Now, we already have analysts from some of the top funds and companies in crypto as subscribers. So if you're serious about getting an edge in crypto, head on over to theblockcrunch.com VIP to learn more. And once again, thanks for supporting the show and I'll see you next week.